Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. And I'm your host, Mike Allen. You know, we call it the day that lives in infamy for a good reason. The Japanese bombing at Pearl Harbor that would draw the U.S. into World War II shook this country to the core. In a nutshell, we weren't ready militarily for what we faced. And yet, we came together and did it building an unparalleled military force that won the battle in pretty much record time. And Connecticut, well, we played an outsized role in that. Our guest today is Sharon Cohen, a communications consultant turned military author who's compiled a tremendous book on the incredible contributions of Connecticut businesses, large and small, to that war. The book, Connecticut Industries Unite for World War II Victory, is available at highpointpub.com, and she'll be along in a minute to tell us all about it. This week's trivia question, what did every Connecticut town have to build or provide for, but few really wanted to do it at all? Stick around after the main program for the answer, because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. Yale New Haven Hospital was the very first hospital in Connecticut. They opened their doors 200 years ago and later introduced the entire country to the use of penicillin and chemotherapy. Today, some of the brightest minds in medicine choose to work there, and it's the primary teaching hospital for the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. For more information, log on to YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. It was December 7, 1941. The Japanese launched a surprise raid on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Not only was the U.S. naval fleet based there simply decimated, but 2,400 service members were killed that Sunday morning. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt turned to the primary communications tool that he had that day, not social media or television, but radio, to deliver the news to a frankly stunned nation. The very next day, on Monday, Congress voted overwhelmingly to enter World War II. Well, one of the biggest problems facing FDR was that we were not ready. The armed forces were antiquated. Not only were we using much of the same equipment that we had used in World War I and it was still hanging around, but FDR's predecessor, President Hoover, had cut military spending. And FDR was also in the midst of trying to pull the U.S. economy out of the dregs of the Great Depression. Well, what followed in the weeks and months after that event was one of those rare moments in this country where everybody kind of parks their differences, puts them aside, and comes together for the common good. And in Connecticut, one of the most remarkable military build-up campaigns began. During the war, the military gave out awards, E-awards, for excellence in production. And there were thousands of companies across this country that created something for the war effort, but only 5% of those companies ever got an E-award. Well, the average state received 90 awards. Connecticut companies received 175, nearly double the national average. And if you look at it from the perspective of states with similar populations at the time to Connecticut, well, we were head and shoulders above our peers. Our guest today is not your typical military historian. In fact, Sharon Cohen will be the first to tell you that she had to educate herself about all things militaristic in order to write this book, Connecticut Industries Unite for World War II Victory. Her book, incidentally, is available not on Amazon, but at www.highpointpub.com. She's going to tell you herself how she happened onto this subject matter in just a second. What I can tell you, though, is that this Wisconsin native who came to Connecticut for college and has called Connecticut home for a number of years documented industries throughout this state in every single corner of the state. Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss them all. She also makes sure that you, the reader, understands just how important the smaller parts were. The ones that the bigger items, the planes, the boats, and submarines couldn't operate without. Sharon, your book, I would say, capitalized on finding really a mother load of absolutely incredible information about Connecticut industries during World War II. 
Now, it was something to do with the State Library, and I was wondering if we could start off. Could you tell me how that all came about? Several years ago, I had my own communication business. Someone came up to me and said, we want to do something special for the vets, and we want to have a special celebration. And we'd love to have you do a book on industry in Connecticut. I said, wow, that sounds kind of interesting. And so I started interviewing individuals, actually women, who were at that time, late 90s and 100-year-old. Then a week later, two weeks later, they said, well, I'm sorry, we couldn't get the money. <laughs> so I put it away in a file, and then I didn't look at it for many years. And then COVID happened, and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I said, geez, you know, I've always been thinking about going back to that World War II story. And then I looked in the file, and I saw, oh, my God, there's an original report here from 1946. I said, that's interesting. And then I said, oh, maybe this is just a fluke. I decided to look online, and then I found out that in 1946, the State Department of War Records had actually written to all the companies in Connecticut because they wanted to make sure that Connecticut received its due rewards. They believed that all the states had done so much, even though Connecticut is one of the leading states during the war in production, they wanted to make sure that Connecticut actually got what it deserved as far as what it had done. I went up to the state library, and I didn't know what I was going to get because I knew approximately where in the archives, because I had a couple numbers there. I requested the boxes, and it was really interesting because in many cases what happens at libraries with archives is that the librarians don't know what is there until they're opened. It's sort of like Christmas, right? Because they aren't the ones who put them in the box 80 years ago for World War II. And so they all gathered around me when I opened the box, and it was like, oh, my gosh, because in there, there's like first-hand reports from 1946, 1947, right from the companies. And each one was different because each one had a different personality. So it was really unique. It gave me goose flesh because it was like being able to go back in time and meeting these people. Well, what you managed to do by taking that raw information in those library boxes and bringing it together in this book, I just got to compliment you. You did a great job. And it drove home for me a couple of really, I think, critical points and things I want to talk about here today. On the one hand, I, you know, I, I'm guilty of thinking, well, when you're putting together a war effort or call it a war machine, whatever you want to call it, airplanes and boats and submarines, and I never really stop to think enough about the small parts. You know, this just would not have happened without this. Your book puts that right straight in front of you so that you can't possibly miss it. And what I want to do here just for a second, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read off 17 industries that you listed there, and I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. So here are the 17 industries. Apparel, chemicals, electrical equipment, fabricated metals, food, furniture and wood, instruments, clocks, machinery, ordnance, primary metals, paper, plastics, rubber, silverware, textiles, and transportation. Now, did you ever get the sense for, my goodness, this was just one heck of an organizational process to even coordinate across all these industries? What I had to do with this book is I wanted to make sure that people, when they read about a company making ball bearings, as you said, small things, or springs, or engines, that they wouldn't just read, oh, we made engines or we made ball bearings. I wanted the reader to understand how important these pieces were, how they were used over in the war, how they save people's lives and how they won battles. One of the trivia questions I love to ask people is how many parts are there on a Boeing 747? And the answer is six million. I thought about it a lot as I was reading your book because just even the tools that make these things or the machines that would cut into precision the metal and the different parts so that they would work. And not only 
did they have to achieve a new level of precision that they did not in World War I, but because we had had to ramp up so quickly after the Pearl Harbor bombing and get into war and we were all antiquated, we had to do this faster. I mean, this was just a Herculean effort. World War and battles was not really an area that I have really studied in the past. My background is more in psychology and sociology. And what really intrigued me was that these were really difficult times. And our country was just as divided, if not more so, than it is now. We had gone through the flu. We had gone through many people dying through World War I and, of course, the Depression. But yet, humans came together in a very, very quick way. And we proved that the human mind has the ability to achieve much more than it's achieving now. That when push comes to shove, we can develop radar, we can develop new optical machinery. It was there all along, but until we really had to do it, we didn't get there. And as you said, in a matter of months, in some cases, a matter of weeks, things were produced, which was incredible. You put something in that book that I just can't get out of my head, and it's about ball bearings. And it was an Air Force raid that we undertook on Germany that knocked out some of their ball bearing plants. Could you tell us that part of the story? Well, we decided to bomb Germany, their bearing factories, because we realized that there is nothing that can be made without bearings. For people who don't know what bearings are, they're very simple. When you take two pieces of metal, and they're both going at a speed, and so they're rubbing against each other, they get hot from the friction because they're rubbing against each other. And, of course, the part itself will not last long, and it won't work as well as it possibly could. So the bearing is another piece of metal or plastic that goes in between these parts. It makes it work much more expediently. Those bearings were so important to airplanes and trucks and tanks and guns. Everything has bearings in it, and the machine tools, as you were talking about before. Without those, you can't produce. And so that's what happened is that we decided, okay, we're going to go bomb the German factories because if they don't have their bearings, they're not going to have their bearings. Is that a pun on words there? I love it. You know, we can always and should always talk about what I would maybe term the big boys, you know, the Pratt and Whitney's, of course, the aircraft, electric boat. Pratt and Whitney made almost half the engines used in World War II. They tripled the population of East Hartford. Sikorsky made the first military helicopters. Electric boat, great story there. They just ramped up their submarine production and, of course, ramped up the number of employees. And, you know, we had a Chance Vought aircraft making the Corsair, which uh, broke five world speed records, at, you know, traveling 400 miles an hour. And the there were also some very, what I would call, some very cool kind of items that were made in Connecticut that I don't think most people know about. So let's start with, say, Perk and Elmer with their optical equipment capability. They were making things like cameras and periscopes. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Perk and Elmer was a new company, and they recognized that the Germans really were the leaders in the optical work and that to get high-grade state-of-the-art optics, we would have to go to Germany. And of course, we couldn't do that. So they came up with the ways of putting glass inside of guns. And so you could actually see what you're shooting at more clearly. A lot of the things, though, that they came up with, you know, they started at the beginning of the war, but then they continued after. One of my favorite examples in your book is this G-Force suit that was made by Berger Brothers in New Haven. Tell us about that. Normally, when we stand, there's a one force of gravity that's pulling us down to the center of the Earth, right? And, but when you go up into a plane and you're accelerating, so think of a pilot who's in a fighter plane, and he's accelerating. Not only is he accelerating, he's turning and going off into different directions. What this does is it puts a much heavier gravity force, weight, 
makes you know, a, you know a hundred pound person feel like they're four hundred and something pounds, right? And it pushes them into their chair. And what happens to the blood is that it drops down from the brain into the feet. We know, of course, that if you don't have blood going into the brain, you black out. So before World War II, about 30% of pilots were actually blacking out and many of them dying. There was several different organizations that were working on how do we solve this problem. And the first one was a man by the name of Franks. And his idea was to take a suit, think about a pilot suit, and fill it with water. That water pressure that water would push up the blood up into the brain. But it was really a sloshy thing. You know, the, the pilots were really not very happy about that. Jaeger said, when I got out of the plane, women would watch as water was rolling out of my pilot suit. So the Berger brothers in New Haven said, why don't we try it with air? And so what they did is they said, okay, we're going to pump air in the plane, the actual from the plane, we're going to pump air into the suit. And that pressure of air will push back the air from the feet back into the brain again. So they came up with this suit, this G4 suit, and it worked very well. But it took the Navy a couple of years to agree to use it, which is kind of sad, but that's typical of war too. Eventually, it saved a lot of lives, and they're still using that today. Now, staying in the cockpit for a second, another problem that faced the pilots was the extreme cold. And General Electric in Bridgeport made a heated suit. Tell us about that. Well, you know, General Electric, was that was their forte. That is their forte was electricity, right, and batteries. And they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to make a suit, like a jumpsuit, we're going to put batteries inside the suit and they made it within weeks they put women's gloves for the hands and they had like little slippers for the feet and then they had wires running through it because what was happening is because it was below zero up there if they put their hand on the window their hand would literally freeze and parts would just drop off i mean it's a horrible thing to think about. And so with this new suit, it kept them warm. Just unbelievable. You know, when you talk about, for example, torpedoes, it's an amazing story that compressed air shoots these things out. And I guess then the first real air compressor that could do this was built in South Norwalk? Yes. And they're still there. And actually, they are one of my favorite companies. The way they wrote their article, there's this wonderful quote by the president of the company that said, why are we here? And we probably don't know now, but we will know when we make it through this, and we will make it through this, and we will be successful, and we'll know that all our efforts were not in vain. We talk about a lot of the companies leaving, and they went either south or west or overseas, but a lot of them still remain here, and they're still doing really good work. I want to wrap up by talking about and giving credit to the companies, and we'll take two examples, that were doing one thing when the war started, and they had to completely revamp their production to make something else that they had to come up to speed on very quickly, because I think they deserve a lot of credit, too. And the first one I'm going to talk about is a company from Ivoryton, which is, for those who don't know, it's along the Connecticut coastline, just a little bit inland, and used to be where all the ivory that came in from elephant tusks from Africa used to be imported into Ivoryton. That's how it got its name. And they used to make piano keys out of ivory and they ended up making training gliders how that happened they had begun to spring out into other industries and i do believe that they actually had a plant somewhere that was starting to look at some kind of aircraft so when the war came they said geez you know what can we make well we can't make ivory anymore of course because we can't get ivory that's it you know ivory's gone and, of course, who wants pianos during the war? So what can we do? And they said, why don't we make a glider? Now, that's really strange. But they actually got together, and they started working on this glider. 
gliders, of course, were another whole different invention because they are quiet. You can load them up with a lot of tanks and troops, and they can come in, and they're not heard. That was very different from what had been done before. And the other example I want to use is Royal Typewriter from Hartford. Now, here's the company that's making typewriters, and other than the people who are doing the official reports for the Army, there's not a big demand for typewriters at that point in time either. So they ended up using the metal finishing capabilities to work on parts for the military in things like machine guns and bullet cores and gas injection rocket bombs. This is just unbelievable. Did you find that surprising as well? Actually, I want to say that most of the companies, even ones that were making like General Electric and other ones that were making large products, a lot of them made armaments. I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of different types of armaments. And so there's usually a part of the factory that was making gliders or the engines or whatever, but there's always this other component where they were making the armaments at the same time. So when Sharon Cohen comes out of the rabbit holes that she went into to learn all this and looks at it from the big picture, what do you take away as maybe the single biggest important point of this book? Is that we humans have a lot more capability than we really realize. And we can drop some of our disagreements and our misunderstandings and work together. There are ways that we can find something to unite us. wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. There are so many other fascinating examples in this book of how Connecticut contributed to the victory in World War II. It's one of those times when I wish the podcast was just longer. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Sharon Cohen, author of the captivating book, Connecticut Industries Unite for World War II Victory, available at highpointpub.com. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, what did every Connecticut town have to build or provide for, but few really wanted to do it at all? Well, the answer is, it was a poor house, an almshouse, a building for town residents who were down on their luck, mentally or physically disabled, or just flat broke with no way to provide for themselves. Next week on Amazing Tales CT, the man who has documented how Connecticut took care of our residents during this chapter in the ongoing saga of providing welfare for the less fortunate among us. It's a compelling story, and I promise you it'll leave you with much to ponder. Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy.